Exciting. You're live. Welcome uh, to another week of Startup School. I'm joined uh, this week by Gustav. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself, maybe your background? Sure. Um, so I work here at YC as a partner. I've been here for uh, two and a half years. Before that, I had most of my growth and product learnings at Airbnb, where I spent almost five years on the growth team as a product manager, um, and spent time on different companies before that working on growth as well. So I feel like I've seen seen some really good stuff at Airbnb and some really hard stuff at other companies, and those, that's where my learning come from. Good stuff also delivers several lectures to the YC core participants during the batch on growth and is kind of the main person that uh, that our founders turn to to ask questions. So you've got the right person in the room today. We're going to take questions from the Startup School Forum. Uh, we're going to take some from Twitter and YouTube comments if we have time. But we've got some from the forum already, so let's uh, let's jump right in. So Kaloyan from My Education Club asks, we're building a peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. Uh, Gustav, you were talking in the video about starting to get paying customers as soon as possible and not to use paid growth until you have paying customers. How does this work for social network platforms or platforms with network effects? So um, historically, if you look in the last 10 years, many of the social products were actually based on advertising. So, so the way that you would make money would not be to charge users, but to charge advertisers to, to advertise to them. Um, what that led to is this idea that you should not try to monetize early. You just try to grow, grow, grow. And that's sort of how many of the early products, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and many of the others that we know, Snapchat, that's how they grew in the early days. Um, Sorry, so they were getting users on the, they were getting users to use the product and then monetizing them once they, correct. Once they were on the Correct. And nearly all of them were growing without using paid marketing. So they're all growing through viral invites or word of mouth or... LinkedIn used the hell out of email. They used email and SEO is the way the LinkedIn grows. So basically, yeah. the two primary channels that LinkedIn would grow would be those two. And I would say for products that have a, a, a um, kind of a, a network effect where for every user that gets on the product, the product gets better, it really matters to get to that first million, a couple million users. So LinkedIn in the early days was useless unless you had some coworkers and people you connect with. Um, that's more rarely the case these days. There are not as many companies who get started where the primary business model is going to be advertising. The reason for that is it's just hard to build a new advertising platform. I mean, that's how they like make money. So Correct. Right. So the business model for companies, either you're charging your users or advertising or some other business model. And there are just a lot fewer companies today that get started using advertising as a business model. Um, the main reason is it's extremely hard to compete with Google and Facebook. They are the best advertising platforms. And it's, re it's difficult. It's not like you're competing with TV or, or newspapers anymore. You're competing with two really great companies. So most companies probably shouldn't be going after that business model, which means they're going after a different business model, most likely charging your users in some way. And if you're going to charge your users, um, um, I guess Twitch would be a good example of something that's like a, a relatively new business model that evolved after the ad-driven kind of placement. They're, they enable creators to actually charge money to, uh, like streamers to actually charge money to people who are consuming it, and they earn you know, percentage of the, uh, the transactions. Right. So to go back to the, the question, how, how does this work for, how does it work and how to not use paid growth? So, so I would say there's only two ways you can re really use paid growth as a way to grow a company. You either, um, have an ROI calculation, that means you, you know how much money you make back from every user you acquire with paid marketing, or you don't. If you do know how much money you're making back, you can scale paid growth as long as you're making enough money back to pay back the money you spent on, on the marketing. If you don't know how much money you're making back, you can't really grow on paid growth. And everything you do I mean, is- You could, but you just spend all your money. <laughs> everything is just like an experiment, but it's a, it's a very time boxed and, and limited experiment because it's just not a sustainable growth and no one's gonna wanna fund you unless they see an extremely clear path to how you're going to make money. And people often have this misconception that, oh, I just grow with paid growth, uh, and then in the future I'll come up with, with how I'm going to make money. I don't believe that's going to work, and I, I think that's a, this sort of failure mode for startups these days. Next up, uh, Michelle from Critique Match asks, is it good to focus on growth as much as possible before implementing a monetization model that might hurt growth? So a monetization model that hurts growth doesn't seem like a very good monetization model to begin with. Um, obviously, you are going to um, want to align the way that people get value from your product and the way that people pay for your product. If you're paying for, say, 
unlocking features, then that's not like the best model. It'd be better if you pay for something um, that actually is very aligned with repeat usage or retention of your product. Um, what are some examples like companies that we've seen recently that have kind of implemented paid monetization in still a company that needs to grow that's like not at scale yet? So I think uh, the truth to here is like, let's take The Athletic as an example. The Athletic is a, is a YC fund company. Um, they're doing really well. They are building a, an app for local news. And the app has a subscription feature where you really can't use the app and read this news from 150 journalists in the US unless you pay them every month. And the truth for mobile apps and for many other companies that are trying to grow is that paid growth is every year becoming a more and more important part of the growth mix of growth, the comp composition of how you're going to grow. Um, back in the days, and people would look down on paid growth and say that's a negative way of growing or that's not a good way of growing. And they would usually say that because it's sort of like, um, there's- You think that the product's not good enough if you have yeah, to pay people and, to- but, but the truth is that if you look on the two platforms through which most of our attention is, is at, Google and Facebook, they have shifted their, their tactics dramatically in the last five years. And, and it's very hard to get free growth on, pay, on Facebook. It's, it's, if you look on search on Google, the first four or five uh, listings is gonna be paid ads. It's, so so yeah. what those platforms like are doing other, is they're, they're, they're trying to monetize products. your usage, which means as a, as a, as a founder of a new company, you should lean into that and, f and f try to figure out how can I grow um, sustainably. The problem with, with, with doing that is it's sort of like you end up paying a tax for every new user that you get to these two platforms. But the reality is that some of the platforms that we know about, a big portion of the growth are coming from these two platforms. Instagram, Facebook, Google are a core component of the growth. If you look on something like Airbnb, um, search marketing through Google was always very critical to our growth strategy and is extremely core to many other travel companies. So. And that's unpaid, that's just SEO? Uh, it's a combination, it's just a combination. But what you can tell from Google is that uh, Google is not innovating as much anymore as it used to, which means there are, to, in order to grow the revenue, they have to kind of increase the paid links and that's what they're doing every year. So to grow organic on, on Google is getting diff more difficult as well. So, so back to the question, like the monetization model that you implement can't really hurt your growth and it should be there early so you can optimize it and then use that monetization to grow. Otherwise, it's going to be difficult to say, um, like, it's going to be difficult to grow organically from the beginning. Like, you can do that to a certain level, but I would argue that there are, um, a cert there's certainly a set of ways to do paid growth sustainably, but that requires you to make money. And I'll kind of synthesize a couple of things that Gustav said here. So, by putting in a paid model early, you're beginning to get knowledge about what your, like, conversion funnel costs. And so, if you know how much money you're going to make per user on your site. That gives you the ability to experiment more effectively with paid marketing. Yeah. Because you know how much money you're gonna earn on the other side. If you don't have that, then as Gustav said, you're just running these experiments that don't, that, that don't really have like viable outcomes. Like you can't actually benefit once you learn how much it costs. So let's take The Athletic as an example. I don't know how much to charge per month. Let's say they charge $15 a month for their subscription for local sports. If you live in Toronto and follow the Toronto Maple Leafs, um, you might be targeted with an ad on Facebook saying, um, download the Athletic apps, uh, app and get local news from independent journalists on their app for $15 a month. Because they know what the conversion rate is for, for that click that comes from Facebook, uh, and they know how much each click is roughly worth, they can actually scale up paid marketing uh, and do it pretty effectively. This is an example, but this is how many companies today are growing. This ties in pretty well to the next question. Um, Suren from Avanka asks, what tools or software have contributed to most of the success um, as a product growth leader? Like, what are the CRMs that you use, lead gen, lead automation? So every company and every category of company is gonna have a different set of tools. So if you're a consumer company or a SaaS company or hardware company, you're gonna use different tools to measure the, 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 the product. Um, I would say at the very basics, you wanna know what's going on. And knowing what's going on for most companies me means having some kind of event analytics. Um, so uh, mixed panel or amplitude or segment or some combination of those uh, or heap, those are all good tools that you can use for the very basic stuff in the sense, how many people are co coming in? How many, what are they doing when they come in? How are they flowing through my product? If they're core flows in your product, like an example of the athletic, what is the onboarding and signup flow? What's the payment conversion flow? Um, what is the returning user metrics like? Those tools will solve all that for you. And at the minimum, those are the things that you need. Uh, Google Analytics is typically not enough. 
um, for most companies. Like it will be good for Google specific stuff, but I would recommend something like Amplitude or Mixpanel. Um, and you can use Segment to, to integrate those two. And, that, and, and that's kind of like a baseline. Like it's that's pretty hard to find a company that shouldn't have, whether you're building SaaS, whether you're building like enterprise, whether you're building like even software that you're individually like onboarding the first few users, you do want to have that baseline analytics that you can always reference. Yeah, and then depending on this, and this goes from day one. You, you this you put in from day one. Uh, then depending on the stage of the company, you use different tools. So like you're not going to do automated sales tools um, until you're at the stage where you can automate sales. In the beginning, most of the times you're going to be doing things that don't scale, and I recommend you to read the Paul Graham article on how to how to do that. Um, you're not going to solve your sales problem in front of your computer necessarily, if that makes sense. You're trying to uh, find your customer, identify your customers, but over time, as you're still building things out, you can start to sort of like build, use tools to build these repeatable things that you do. But most people that are asking for these tools in the very beginning are probably not thinking about it right. They should probably just go out of the office and meet their first 50 or 100 customers and, and get to know them more than trying to interact with them through a tool. Well, like here's an example. I was talking to a founder, a YC founder the other day, and they were asking about how to automate their um, email system. And I was like, how many emails are you sending out? Or who, who's, who's the target for these emails? And they were like, oh, well, it's actually other YC founders. And I said, whoa, like that is totally not the right direction to go. At the beginning, when you're forming like an individual, when, when you're selling, just send the email from your own account. Like, you, think about it this way. You get a lot of email. The ones that you respond to are probably from your friends or family or other co coworkers, and they look like real email, like just text. So it turns out that those actually have a much higher conversion rate, especially in the early days as you're like forming these one-on-one -on -one connections. Yeah, and another good example here is customer service. So, so um, anyone who's trying to build out a send desk or some kind of forum with from the beginning aren't attempting to learn enough from their users. So as a founder of a company, I would want to receive all the emails from all my customers direct into my email inbox, and I want to reply with my name so that they feel surprised that they're hearing from the founder of the company. That is like a great... And you can do that. And there's like, a great story yeah. from Airbnb here. Uh, Joe and Brian actually, um, their cell phone numbers is what they shared for the first couple of hundred hosts. And they've kept calling him for years. <laughs> and, they, they, and, they, and Joe didn't change his numbers. So like, yeah. his numbers are out there. And that was not negative. That's a really positive thing. He learned so much in relationship with these hosts over, over, over those, those years. So as a first-time founder, like, or sorry, as a founder getting started, um, you don't really want a lot of systems besides tracking how your activity on the product is happening to interact with your customers. You want to just do it directly. So that, that leads into the next question quite well. Uh, Khan from Haystack asks, customers often have a pain, but they don't know how to solve it. The re this results in pretty vague feedback. Um, how do you take feedback and iterate on product? Um, so a common question, well, a common way to do user research is to ask extremely open-ended questions uh, and, and, and not interrupt, interrupt them too much and, and not make a lot of assumptions. So, so one thing we used to do with Airbnb when we were launching a new product is we would take that product either on a laptop or on a phone and we just walk down, downstairs in our office and we would show that the screens to random people that sat down there and be like, just tell me what you think this is. Wait, your colleagues or just to random people? To random people. That were like in the in, lobby or whatever. They were in the lobby. Oh, that's cool. Our product was meant to be for the mainstream, so everybody should be able to understand it. Yeah, and you have hosts coming into the, you know. Everybody. Whatever. And then we just ask them to slide through um, the screenshots of the things that we're trying to build and just be like, what do you think this is? What do you think this means? Like, what like do you think? Instant product feedback. Yes. And like, if they didn't get it, like if you ask 10 people and most didn't get it, it wasn't self, I mean, you're not going to be there um, looking over the shoulder with any of your customers. They're just going to be there on, on their own alone. So, so if most people out of a group of 10 random, random people aren't getting it, it's not good enough. It's not like sort of like obvious enough how the product works. And the other thing that we did, there's two other things. Um, we sometimes we use something called usertesting.com. I don't know, actually, not sure if I would recommend them anymore, but, but um, at the time they were, they were good enough for the problem we were solving. You do the same thing. We would ask users to do something very simple in the Airbnb app. And then you, on usertesting.com, you would, some random person would, would get paid to do that task and then record themselves as they're doing it and then speak up and say what they're doing. And it's like this, and then we would little watch. It's eye opening. I opening. Watch 10 of these videos and people are pulling their hairs. The designers and the product people and engineers are pulling their hair because they can't believe why people can't get what they're doing. 
But the truth is that most people don't understand most products. And um, if you come in with the assumptions in these meetings, it's not gonna work. So you have to like just let it out there and then learn from that. So to play on this, one, one of the things that I've found is like, we, we always talk about data. We talk about this like, you know, track, get, get your analytics set up and track all this data. But oftentimes, like a founder's confronted with like, well, what do I do? I have all this data. So I think what you, what you mentioned is actually one way to cut through that. So if, if the data shows that you're having this problem or if you're having this conversion, one of the ways that you can get like a solid answer is to spin up one of these user testing, yeah. like 10 minutes, 30 minutes, and ask the person, like just ask five people to go through the pain point. Yeah. Like I, my, my hunch is that most of, like most of, you don't have to ask a thousand people to get that answer. I think they used, like five they, they used to be such that they used to say 10 people was good enough to get like a guidance on like, is, yeah. is this good or bad? And because and they can be it's a big enough, big enough sample, can be your, can be your friends. The, the key thing is to not give guidance. Now, don't tell so like what you're supposed to do. Just tell them either a goal or just ask them to speak up when they're as they're going through the flow. And I think from my experience, that makes you want to standardize things. That makes you want to use extremely clear language. Like people try to be smart about language in their app and clever about how to market their their the product is those things tend to go extremely wrong. And like, what you really want to do is just use kind of user interface language. Like, what happens here? Click on this button, what happens here? That's my experience of, of how you make something people actually understand how to use. The next one is a question that a bunch of you asked. Um, how do you grow a multi-sided marketplace and retain users on that marketplace? So I think there's many things in this question. I get this question a lot. Um, so, so I can talk about it. I'm going to talk about exactly how I would kickstart a new marketplace today. And then why people, I think, ask this question might not be exactly what I'm going to talk about. So I'll talk about this in a second. So first, if I were to start a new marketplace today, I would try to build up the supply first. And I would build up the supply um, sort of artificially to the level, a uh, small number of supply, artificially to a level where um, it would reflect what the idea of I have, have the product. So let's take an Uber or Lyft for an example. If I would launch Uber and Lyft today, in a new city, I would find 10 drivers, it could be friends, and I would make sure that they are driving, we're Lyft and Uber, for the next four or five days, and then I would go like out get, and- Get the friends to actually Yeah, like they're, they're just gonna right. drive, they're, going, they're committing to drive for all that time. I basically have now artificially created this like 10 day, or, or something of, of 10 drivers who's going to be on the streets. And then I would go and get the demand afterwards. So we actually have an example from one of the companies. Uh, it's called Aptly. Yeah. It's an online marketplace that lets founders test out their experiments with their target with target audiences to validate their assumptions, which is almost exactly like what we were talking about. Yeah. So the person was asking, like, how do we how do we get this marketplace going? Yeah. So so if I would build rebuild that that idea, I would get ten really good people that are my friends. Maybe you have to pay them. Maybe you don't. Maybe they're willing to sit through. Um, X number of these sort of sessions. I mean, you must have a lot of friends who are founders as well, right? Yeah. Get them to volunteer a little bit of time. But don't go out and get like strangers for the supply yet. Like validate that, that there's demand before you go and figure out how to get the supply. Um, and then um, have them sit through it and then see what the demand, feedback from the demand so is. So you've got this like early supply. So you've yeah. got your friends all volunteering their time on this marketplace. And let's talk about like how to, how, like the, what I mean, the level of quality. So. In the early days of Airbnb, we actually allowed to apply like listings to sign up without a user photo, without a photo of the house. Like, how crazy is that? Like, that was the dumbest idea ever. But it took us a while to figure out that was a really dumb idea. What you really want, of course, is like quality. you can't list unless yeah. you have quality. You can't be an Uber driver unless you have a nice car or you're a safe driver. And I think this is one of the things that you can do now when you before you have scale. So you can actually curate this initial list and like your ten friends. You don't make them build the profile. Like. Let them let, let, build the profile for them. Post yeah. it. Like just do everything. And once you demand, once once you validated the supplies, so in this case of Uber or in this case of the user testing.com, if you got into people on the demand side, you do it again. Like if I use Uber and had a good experience, chances are I do it again in the next ten days. And if I had a good experience, and it's up to you to define what a good experience is in in how you're creating the supply. If I do it again, that's a really good sign. The people are voluntarily coming back and either doing this experimentation site or the Uber a second time. So like on this experimentation question, so you're building a marketplace, you, you've got your 10 or 15 friends like that you're kind of coercing into being those early people. Now you're going out onto the supply side and you're, you know, 
Or sorry, yeah, yeah. Uh, the man side, exactly. So like you've got the first people that are coming in the door saying like, hey, could you test out this feature? Um, how, do you, how do you retain them? Like how do you get them to come back? So um, I would always ask people that come in, um, like what was the experience like? Can they review the site? Or just like get some, like, like by some, phone? Yeah, yeah. quality of feedback from, from these people of whether they had a good, good or bad experience. Um, it's sometimes hard to get quality feedback from people who had a bad experience because they tend to like just not care. <laughs> uh, and sending surveys for people that retain that are sort of churned users is always tricky, but it's very very important because you want to understand why people didn't find that a good experience. And um, if, well, they, if they didn't have a good experience, you need to work with the demand and try to understand what about the idea you had in your head for the supply is not correct. It's like debugging the yeah. debugging the marketplace. Yes. One of the things that I've seen founders like benefit a lot from is asking for phone number during the sign up flow especially during the early days so that if something does go wrong or if you want to if they actually have a great experience you can like physically like you could phone them up and get an answer like email sometimes like it's easy to push off it's easy to blow that off for like a week and you might be like in the dark about this person had a great experience but i can't get them on the phone yeah. or i can't i can't get word back from you and you just like well, one, phone them. once you've gone through this phase and like now demand really wants what you're offering now you have to figure out the price like literally what is demand willing to pay for that quality of supply and that is the thing you is not uh, straightforward either like in the case of this experiment like getting your friends to do um, reviewing ex experiments or ideas um, the friends might not be willing to do that at the price that I'm willing to pay. So as, as you suggest in the com, I think I pay them $45 per test. I'm going to assume that $20 maybe went, made its way to that person that was reviewing me. Uh, I can see how some people want to do that. I don't see how everyone want to do that for $20. Yeah. Um, so I think this really depends on sort of like, this is what really what you're trying to figure out. Um, and most of us would rent out our home for some price. Maybe we're not, all of us will do it for the current market price. So like that's why Airbnb, not everybody in the world is, is an Airbnb host, for example. And your pricing is kind of part, part of your product market fit journey. Like you'll be experimenting and adjusting that as you, as you tune it. Right. Next up, uh, Daniel from Storylo asks a pretty tactical question. Um, they make custom uh, photography easy and affordable. So he's asking, can you outline the pros and cons of incentivized growth? Example, like Airbnb, the invite a friend for 25 bucks, or Uber's, Uber's um, subsidized rides. Great, so, so I spent a lot of time on this, and I, I, I worked on the referral program for most of the time I was at Airbnb. Uh, it grew to a significant portion of the growth, and from my experience, referral programs uh, have a couple criteria to make them work well. The first one, they're the products that already have word of mouth. They already um, have people telling their friends about it, so they're not private product in, in, that, in that sense. They also sometimes require a friend. The product is radical enough that the friend can really help convince me about using the product. So great examples here are Uber, our Airbnb, um, and, and some of the things that are just new that I might not trust without, without um, a friend telling me about it. Sorry, Sometimes just, to, just to dive in. So you're saying like the products where having another friend recommend it actually makes the new customer more likely to buy? Uh, or that the product may, gets better if, the, if your friends are on it as well? Maybe I wouldn't trust the product, or maybe I wouldn't trust the idea unless the friend recommended this to me. Um, so I wouldn't trust... And that's why you might put in a referral program. Like, Maybe. think of this, like the, the, current, the Airbnb today and the Uber of today are very different than the first month of those two products. Most people would be like scared of those two ideas the yeah. first time they heard about it. And it's only until the, when they get gets into the mainstream where you now get comfortable for everyone to do, to do it. In that early days, if the idea is that radical, um, having a friend convince you that, that is not scary is one of the is, is really good fundamentals, foundation for a good referral program. Because what referrals ultimately do is they just like push them over the edge a little bit to do it, and it pushes the person that received the referral over the edge to actually try the product. And it does it a couple of percentages on each side, and that could really matter. So what's interesting is that you haven't mentioned the actual savings or the percent off. Like that is almost not it's just, really part of yeah, it. Yeah, it's so, more so, like so the, the money is important, but the, the, the money cannot just be added to any product. Like I think it does matter that the product um, kind of requires this in some sense. Um, and then the second thing is that the product needs to have a regularly active user base. So, so what I mean by that, like a product that you only use once in your lifetime, referrals are li less likely to work well because you only have one chance to get someone to actually send, tell their friends. 
versus every time I use Lyft or Uber, I get reminded that I could give my friends $25, Five bucks, yeah. is actually, there is some conversion every single time I do that. And, and for Airbnb, for example, after you made a booking or after Lyft review, were the two by far best places to ask someone to invite a friend to Airbnb. And I think we had a 20% click-through rate on both those places. So 20% of everyone who gave a review or, or made a booking actually went into the referral phone and, and half of them, I think, ended up sending invites. So that was pretty effective. Um, but people weren't coming back to Airbnb regularly in a way that they were willing to be interrupted. To right, be asked and you only question. do like an Airbnb, yeah. if, you're, if you're staying, you only do it once a year or once every yeah, six months or something People travel like once yeah. a year. And then the, the reason I mentioned this is because most people, they don't think about this, where do I get notified or kind of uh, interrupted about the referral program? They just be like, oh, I just put it in the menu. I put yeah. it in the settings menu. But they're not coming back to Airbnb. People don't, like, yeah. the, the metric that you want to track to figure this out is, percent of weekly active users to see the link to a full program. And if you do track that metric and you look at the people that go to your settings page, no one's gonna go to your settings page. Um, if you put it in the menu, people are typically in, in an interaction of doing something else. So you can't put it in like, in the, in the sort of like the workflow that the user is going through because they don't wanna really, wanna, they really, don't really wanna be interrupted when they're doing what they're doing. Um, so that, that's the first couple of things. The second thing is like referrals is paid marketing in the sense that you need to be able to make the money back you're giving away. So a lot of people get excited about this idea of referrals, but they're not making enough money on the back end to actually make it work. So they're like, maybe they make $10 per users. The truth is that most Americans don't care to take any action for $5. Because if it's $5 on each side, people just don't care about it. So you need to have some minimum number, and I think that number is like $15 or more, um, that you need to be able to give away. Otherwise, people just aren't gonna care very much, and this is not gonna work well. I think their MB referral program right now is $55 to receiver in the US and 30 or something to, this, to the sender. Those are meaningful numbers, and they can be 10%, 15% of your trip uh, as you travel for the first time. So it can be really, really impactful. What we saw at Airbnb is that this does matter. Uh, next question is from Justin at Luge Looks, uh, Lounge Looks. Um, my co-founder and I have built Lounge Looks. Lounge Looks provides online tools to home-based beauty and grooming professionals to help them grow and manage their clientele. So all of their customer acquisition right now comes from outreach, cold emails, DMs on Instagram, and it's working. But they don't feel like it's scalable, uh, especially if they want to grow faster. At what point do they need to be honest with themselves and figure out like what the scalable growth channel is here? And how long can they stay on this kind of direct method? Great question. Uh, when do you switch to scaling, scaling growth channels? Um, the truth is that there are only a couple really scaling growth channels in the world. Paid marketing, I mean, there are different type, type of paid marketing. Um, SEO, word of mouth, sales, viral growth, and maybe one or two more. Like, there's not that many others. So first you need to think of like, which of these channels actually fit my product well. And um, so this is like in, in the in the yeah. talk that I give. There's on YouTube. I have a slide that I borrowed from another another uh, person. Uh, that is sort of like a criteria on how you figure out which which of these categories does my product fit into. I think what you're describing here is probably a product that on the demand side fits well into marketing because of the level of targeting that you can do. And it seems like uh, lunch looks have revenue, and that revenue can be used to pay for that paid marketing. Um, the challenge with paid marketing is that you don't want to reacquire users. So in the case of Airbnb, for example, going back to that, that example, we wouldn't want to go to and get pay for you to click on our Google ad every time you make a booking. We only want to do that the first time. So after that, we want you to install the Airbnb apps. And next time you do a search for, for travel, you do it in our app. Most companies think about this that way in that the first time you might be acquiring users through paid marketing, but you don't want to do that concurrently because it adds a lot of risk to um, to your sort of growth strategy. It's much better if you would then, um, um, if you basically have some natural entry point that a user is gonna open, that could be an app, it could be some email, or it's just some way that I'm not going to uh, have, to have to pay for reacquire that user. Um, so in this case, I think paid marketing is probably the most likely place. Uh, referrals might be the second most likely. Uh, and, and the good news is if you are earning money, you can begin to like experiment with those because you know how much the customer is worth after you, you know, close them. Um, cool. Next up is, uh, in your experience, this is a Max from M Mamalo. Uh, in your experience, especially at Airbnb, what are some of the key product sales activities that you did to reduce lead time? And to what extent did lead time matter? So I do you think, think, lead, lead, I do think lead time would be like how long it takes to close a sale. Oh, um, so in Airbnb's case, this is not um, 
super applicable, uh, except for um, on the consumer on the consumer side in travel. Um, the truth is that we are all as consumer pretty susceptible to things like exclusivity, scarcity, urgency, messages like that. And now is those are in some cases dark patterns. And dark patterns, what I mean by that is like they're just messing with our minds, but actually not really adding any 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 value. Like the urgency thing, yeah. Yeah, but like what we did at MB and the way we th thought about that is like let's use this stuff as information. So let's say you do a search on San Francisco, and there's only forty percent of the listings left. We should tell you that because that gives you a real sense of urgency that you need to book soon because if you if you are booking some of the last 10%, then you might not get a good deal. Like it might be a pretty bad deal because all the good ones are already booked by everyone else and everyone else is rational. Um, so our view was to uh, surface these, these tactics, urgency, scarcity, exclusivity, um, sort of like in an, in an informal way and not in a, in a way that kind of like- Overbearing. Pop, overbearing yeah. and, and sort of like mess with your head. Uh, another example is what we call a unique find or a rare find. So, if you found a listing, we would literally tell you this listing is usually booked. It's a rare find, and that's just sort of like sends a positive signal about the, the listing instead of saying like it's almost it. sold out or something. Yeah, something yeah. like that. That's a really I like that. I, I've seen the rare fi yeah. the rare find. And they, the, the truth is that they work extremely well because um, as users we we react well to those messages, and yeah. that's, that's that's the reality. Um, would I prefer that didn't work well? Well, I think. You just need to think hard about what is the perception of the tactics that you use as you're trying to get people to do what you're doing. And, and all, all the e-commerce sites for consumers have some level of these tactics. Um, but you need to just make sure that they are user friendly and, and they're not um, just there as messing with your psychology, but actually kind of giving you some real value. Yeah. Um, we got a question from the YouTube comments. Uh, Mo asked, how would you implement a referral program in B2B? where a business can refer another business for a bonus? So this is a good question. Uh, so, so it's complicated in a couple of, couple of sense. So um, a referral for B2B, an example of that would be um, if I work for um, a SaaS service and I get $500 to refer another customer through that sort of SaaS service. The thing you have to think about first is what is the likeliness that I know other people in my role that would be buyers of this service? So, Let's say the SaaS service is a, um, is a payroll software. What's the likeliness that I know other people who work in HR and other companies that would be buyers of the payroll software? In the founder community, probably fairly true, but in the larger mainstream world, like less likely so. Uh, now there are exceptions and there are certainly cases where this could work. Um, there are some legal implications, like you can't give someone a thousand bucks to then put in your pocket and, and then refer um, and then sort of like convince the com my company to start using software and I put the money in the pocket. That, I think that's basically bribery. Yeah. So there are legal problems with doing this. Um, I don't know exactly where the line is drawn there. Now, I think you should Well, that having been said, like Gusto has a thing that's, Gusto's a payroll software. They have a very prominent like refer someone else and you get 500 bucks cash. Yeah, so I think, I think the case where this works really well is for example, um, owner, like founder owned own businesses, so like small businesses. It's very often the person they're referring is also the owner of the business. And I don't think there's any legal problems if I... And where that would make a meaningful amount, like 500 bucks to like sure. a beauty salon if, that's if, recommending if their software. we both small businesses and I refer you uh, a payroll software and you get a few hundred dollars off your payroll software yeah. and you're the owner of the business, that makes a ton of sense. Because it goes back into the... Yeah, and know, I, think that, I think for small businesses, this works really well. For larger ones, I think that these, this gets really complicated. But I think for small businesses, it's not a bad idea at all. But I think the other thing that I would say is sort of like helping people, um, there are ways that you can be smart about who might, um, like helping people like, um, for example, you can use Google Apps and the Google, Google context to sort of like plan ideas in people's head of who might need, need the software. Um, so I, I think, probably too, too long of a thing to go into right now, but I think there are things that you can do to just like, um, at least plant the idea in the head of like, who else do you know that runs payroll? or who else do you know that needs this type of specific SaaS software? And people always do. Um, and you can do it during your customer interviews because as you're talking to them or, or when you're onboarding them, you can always, like if they, if they express interest, if they're, if they're excited about the product, you'd be like, do you think your friends might be interested? Like who are they? Tell me about their business. And, and sometimes their roles are more fluid. So example, recruiting, people are more likely to move between companies and recruiting roles, in my experience, uh, are very good at sharing software and tools between um, the yeah. different, different companies. 
Uh, we've got a question from Erica at uh, Kiefer Labs. How do you reach out and educate people on the amazing benefits of your product and the utmost solution it provides if you have an unfamiliar product and name like probiotic kefir? How do you break the wall and scale it? Seems like a general question. What do you think, Eric? I think that, uh, I mean, I, I would take this question about like branding. Mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you, as a startup founder, like, there's two types of products. There's one where you need to educate the market and teach people about like this new product or new category. And then there's the other one where you're, you're building a competing product to an existing incumbent and you have to price it or market it accordingly. I would say that this question is more around like how do, you, how do you build like enthusiasm for something that's actually completely new? Um, I think it's different in consumer as for B2B. I think for B2B what I would start with is Two things, I would first show them the product. So like, I, I've learned this in working with a bunch of YC companies that it can really help just including a screenshot or a video of what the product is. Um, trying to explain this new idea for someone to solve a, an, an existing problem, because it's not a new problem you have typically, uh, can be much harder than to just show them the product. So we found that in B2B SaaS companies, it's like how, including a screenshot or a video of how it works. Which might, is tough might, to do, because oftentimes when people include screenshots, they're like of the entire product. Yes, you need to have like, the screenshot needs to be a specific thing that people recognize and be like, aha, that's the thing. Then like, I could see myself using this. Yes, yes. So like, um, I can think of a million things here. Uh, and the second thing um, uh, on the B2B side is, is just to include social proof. So a lot of people are afraid of trying new things unless there's someone that they trust have tried it. So like, would you try this new payroll software? No. Would you try the new payroll software that Airbnb and Dropbox is using? Yes. And kind of to tie this back to your point about referrals, this is where the referral program kicks in because if you're selling something that's actually kind of new, but you have a trusted friend who's the one who's like introducing the product to you, we'll, we'll talk about like uh, Soylent, for example. Yeah. So like I think you're selling a, kefir, I think it's like yogurt, right? Um, so Soylent was a product that was like, pretty new like people eat food but they definitely didn't eat Soylent and so at the beginning they they had this entire community where people like participated on this forum and they would talk about it and I'm sure that those people were the ones who were telling the first other new users that they should try this thing called Soylent. Yeah I think consumer products tend to if they are new enough they tend to sort of like have warm up built into them um, if they don't that's the problem and, and the category where this is difficult I think is very private products it's like Private products that are brand new, it's just like, they're just notoriously hard. What's an example? Like, um, stuff that I just put in, I use to do my bathroom that I don't talk to other people about. Like, 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 like hymns or something like that. Hymns, would be, is, a yeah. great, hymns is a great example. Like, or you're like, not necessarily going to be like rebroadcasting that you're like a hair loss. Hair loss you know, products. Person. Like, those things are typically not things that just lend itself too well for these, these conversations. Um, so, but it's interesting. They, they flipped it on its head. They actually like brought it into the conversation a little bit. So that might have been a smart move. Yeah. And then it was one more point on that question. Um, uh, the second thing is like I would, for this question, try to get some brand association in the sense like try to get written up in some papers and sort of like some some authoritative sort of media that you know about and then include sort of like links and, and lo yeah. logos to that. And like if there's a new product I never heard of, but if New York Times written about it, like I'm certainly going to increase my, my... They don't have to write about your specific product. They just have to write about this category. And so if you can like attach yourself to a category that's on the rise, that would help. I wouldn't go extremely far to get, get this done, but I would say that for something brand new I've never heard of, having some level of social proof from some media yeah. outlet does help. Next question is, uh, how do you balance growth against the backlog of cosmetic quality of life bugs and tickets? It's a false, false question. Uh, as a startup founder, you always have to do everything. And, and, and like, it's really hard to say, oh, YC have allowed me to work on growth so I don't have to work on quality or, yeah. or vice versa. Like that is not sort of like how you can think, think about these. these um, well, there's a tension to it, right? There's always a tension, but there's never gonna be a black and white situation. Um, they are tightly coupled. Um, and if you have bad quality of product, you're not going to get growth. And if you have lots of bug, bugs and tickets, people are going to churn, and you're not going to get growth because, like, having retained users is typically what, what gives you growth. Um, I think the most important thing that I would advise this founder on is just like truly try to understand what drives growth and what drives retention, uh, or what, what drives churn. Like, what makes people unhappy and stop using your product? What pe makes people happy to use your product? I'll give you an idea of what people actually care about in your product. 
Um, and, and from that point, from, like once you have that information, this question gets easier to answer. Um, another question from the YouTube stream. Would you recommend SEO for early stage startups? Um, so SEO is interesting. Uh, SEO is sort of like still a very big channel because most people in the world still use Google to answer most questions that are not daily questions. Um, and the questions that we ask Google are changing every year. So, so this year we might ask the question like, who is, and then like, politician name that we didn't ask a year ago. So like the, the search volume and, and the keywords that goes into Google actually changes quite a bit. Or what is Soylent? You might have not asked that five years ago. Um, so for that perspective, like if you can capture the keywords of, of something new, um, it's possible that this can work really well for you. If the question is, what should I do in Paris? You're not going to be able to rank for that most likely because there are five other companies that are, that are they have a lot of money. Public companies yeah. and a 100-people team work on that, trying to rank for that specific question. So think about the question you're trying to rank for and how new are they. The newer they are, the chance, the bigger the chance that you can actually succeed. <laughs> if these are established questions that people have been asking for years, like, what is a good mortgage? Like, you're not going to be able to rank for that um, because it's so competitive. It'll take you years of things that you might not even control to be able to do that. So that would be my first question, like, 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 is this something new? And is it good to for? think about it around the idea of a question that people are asking? No, it could be any kind of keywords, but like the, the words that people put into Google are the ones Questions, that you should, yeah. you should you think through. The second thing is, is there's two ways to really grow SEO. One is to write a lot of good, high quality content that get ranked. And the second thing is to do something that's automated, where you have a lot of content that's sort of like automated, automatically created. So MB is more than the latter. So MB would have, um, lots of landing pages for different cities where there are different listings or even this different listings sell themselves or ways you would organize those listings. That's more automa automatically created versus many startups in the early days literally would just write really good content. So um, maybe in the case of hair loss, you would literally write um, super high quality, unique content about that those questions. And you would always start with the keywords itself. So, so before you try to figure out, um, so like in this process of figuring out SEO is a good idea, you want to go to Google, you want to use a tool called the Keyword Planner, and search for those keywords and see how much traffic they get. If they get a lot of traffic, now you can start the exercise and try to figure out if you, if, if you can do anything here. If they don't get any traffic, then it doesn't really matter what you do, because no one's going to search for that. Kind of on that note, uh, I've got a question. What's your opinion on social media marketing channels these days? They, keep, they seem to keep changing. Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, TikTok. Where would you put your focus? This is probably where I'm the least expert. And Maybe one of the reasons I'm least expert is because they do change so often, so it's really hard to keep track. Um, on one end, I would say I, I, I quite frequently run into companies who are successful at getting, say, influencer marketing or some Snapchat filter or something in the, that world working. I am very re rarely run into companies who said, we made that work and now we're like 100 million users. Because these tactics tend to be quickly saturated, and the companies that you're building on top tend to be not in favor of giving away free traffic. They want to charge for that traffic. So they don't really typically allow you to do some hack for too long, and then they tend to remove it. And if you compare, for example, Instagram with previous platforms, Instagram doesn't really allow links. Why? Because they don't want spam, and they don't want people to sort of like hijack the, the, the app for a bunch of commercial messages. They want the commercial messages that exist inside ads. That just that pay the money. That yeah. pay the money. So the one channel in social media marketing that does work is to buy ads from them. That is a truly scalable channel. And TikTok, for example, I believe was one of the biggest advertisers on, on Facebook and Instagram the year before uh, 2018 or 2019. Um, but they literally just bought ads, spent a billion dollars buying ads on Facebook, and that's how they grew to this. Partly how they grew to the scale they are today. So that's the one channel that does work forever. All the other stuff is like will probably work to some extent for some period of time. And then other people will discover it, they'll come in. Either other people will discover it or the platform itself will make that yeah. thing harder. Uh, next question is from Jose at Arcade. Arcte, an instructor-led online education for future game developers and designers in Latin America. Uh, he says that our courses are self-paced, meaning the student pays for a course that could they, they could finish it quickly or it could take up to a year. How would you measure retention for a service that could take a long time? Um, if you have dropouts, is it an indication that people don't like the product? Um, so I would start by having probably two metrics. The first metric would be dropouts. And the second metric would be some metrics that predicts dropouts. 
Um, so my guess that the people that would drop out were the people that didn't take the course anymore. Um, if you find that that's true, there's a strong correlation between people that stop taking your course, then drop out, then you can actually start measuring that first metric, like are people stop taking the course? Because most likely they'll lead to a drop out. Drop out. Um, so I think I would just sort of like try to figure out what's the predictiveness of, of someone stop using your service. And Airbnb, for example, if someone left a one-star review, highly predictive of someone not booking again. So we should definitely try to avoid people uh, having a one-star one, one star review experience. Or uh, people never searching on the site for another year after their first booking is also quite predictable of them not booking again. So there are these kind of like um, um, predictive metrics, so to speak, um, that can predict either um, the next big good behavior or, or, or sort of like bad for you. Um, so that would be my recommendation. Try to figure out what predicts people dropping out. Uh, Michael from Hilo. Uh, Hilo is um, building a platform where users share the high and low points of their workday anonymously with their team leaders. Uh, he asks, should you say yes to everything? For example, we had a company, they had a company of 100, 150 employees approach them and want to implement us even at the MVP stage. He thinks that if he says yes, he has no idea what they're going to do in terms of actually handling that. Um. So if you have demand for your product, um, it's a great time, I think, to just ask for a price <laughs> and see if they, what they're willing to pay. Yeah. Um, if they're willing to pay 50 bucks a month per employee or 20 bucks a month per employee, it's like, sure. Like, sounds why amazing. would you not yeah. do that? That sounds like a great first customer. If they're not willing to pay, now they might not be willing to actually use it. Uh, like They're not that much buying from the company to actually care about what you're building. And it might, this idea sounds, new and interesting, um, but new enough that um, I suspect a lot of people that hear about this idea would say, that sounds interesting. I think I want to try that. To try it. But, but, but they didn't say, I would try that for 50 bucks a month for a one-year contract for all my employees. Yeah. I, would be, I would be surprised if they say that right away. So in this scenario, I think you really need to figure out like, what is the value? And this might take some time to figure out what the value that you can charge for is, but... But the good news is, is it sounds like people are excited and they're like, they're, they're excited in trying even an MVP and you really want to get that. Like the danger here would be taking this as positive feedback and then going and continuing to build your product without interacting with the customer. So the right move, I think, is what, what Gustav said, is to go back to them and say, would you actually like be a paid customer of this early MVP product? If they say yes, then, I mean, you just got your first customer. If they say no, you'll figure out what is the delta between what your MVP is and what they would be willing to pay you for. Go down. Oh, the letter sharing question. Missed it. Sorry? No. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, this is a question from Twitter. Um, we're uh, to re, Airbnb for luggage sharing. The concept of luggage sharing is quite novel in India, and the market is hugely untapped. How do we scale our product or concept to a larger audience and with investors? This is a great question. I actually used my first luggage sharing app last year. No way. What yes. was your use case? Uh, my use case was I just checked out my Airbnb. In, 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 we were staying in Harlem, and we're going to Penn Station to take the train to DC, and I didn't want to carry my bag around for a couple of months, a couple, couple, couple hours. Yeah. And that's natural. Hotels will do this for you. Airbnb does not do this for you. And then you have a checkout at 11 a.m. So the rest of the day, you kind of have to carry your luggage around. So there's a clear need. Now, there isn't actually a great product for this. There are a bunch of products, and I tried a couple of them. Um, but there's no one that is exactly what I want. So what I would do here is I would build an app. An app allows you to, once someone has found you through Google, which is the most likely place you'll find this, um, Install the app and keep the app on your phone. The app is going to be the thing that I remember next time I need this. I just go to the app and, and, and automatically opens the app and the map and see what do I have near me or I type in an address. The second thing is you want to make sure you have some level of trust. So the one thing I experienced uh, storing my luggage, I actually just store my luggage in a restaurant, um, sort of at the side. And it felt like if they weren't looking around, someone can come in and grab my luggage. And I didn't feel safe because that was going to be my computer. So the second thing is like, I really think you want to build in some level of guidance to this, the locations, and some level of maybe a guarantee that you can offer uh, that makes me trust that my luggage is safe. Uh, uh, this, the third thing is like, you then need to figure out how can I put this in front of people every single time they check out their Airbnb. So you can try to talk to Airbnb business development team. Uh, it will be hard if you're a small startup. They might not care about you unless you have 
thousands of locations around the world where this is possible. Um, but it would be a pretty good idea um, to integrate that sort of like after you made a booking, just like you have rental cars that's tied to hotel bookings, et cetera. But you could also do that without actually talking to Airbnb. You could talk to Airbnb hosts Absolutely. directly. So every Airbnb host sends a little pre-formatted email with every, t every time someone checks. It has like the address, how to get there, and like how to get there from the airport. You could maybe convince some of them to include a little line in it saying, and then. Absolutely. And the good idea, the cool, cool thing with this idea is, is you can start just like Airbnb started. You start in the big cities. So, and there's a lot of like, they do a lot of New traffic. York, London, yeah. like all the places where people, there's a lot of travelers to where you definitely need to store your luggage. And, and I think, again, think of the cities where you walk a lot. Um, probably LA wouldn't be the best place because I can bring, I'm not going to walk around LA yeah. as much as I will do somewhere else. Start with cities where you, can, you need to walk a lot, um, get a bunch of places that you can store your luggage that are all around the city, but specifically where people are going to go next. So if that is like the airport or that is the train station or whatever the people are going next, that's where probably I'm going to pick up my luggage, luggage app afterwards. The, the innovation I haven't seen yet here is sort of like, I open the app, I push a button, and within 10 minutes, someone comes and pick up my language. Hmm. That is the innovation I, I was hoping for. I would have paid like 15, 20 bucks just to have someone get my lang luggage. And Which makes sense. Like you could piece that together using on-demand like, totally. yeah. like, like Uber. You order an Uber and pick my luggage. <laughs> you and, heard it here first, guys. And then drive my luggage to where I'm going to pick it up. Uh, I would pay 20 bucks to not have to drive my, my luggage around all day. Uh, but no one was offering that. That does not exist as far as I know. But I think that would be a pretty good idea. And you don't even have to store it in like a restaurant. You can store it someone's back. You want to hear this cool thing? So in, in Japan, you can actually drop your luggage off at any 7-Eleven and have it sent through like some sort of network to their hotel that you're going to be at. It's like a very cool system. I believe that once people have dust this, this once, they'll do it forever. So once you've realized that this was the easiest way to carry my luggage throughout the day, yeah. people do it forever. So I certainly think there's more to explore here. Uh, and I think there will be a company. I've seen shopping, a couple, shopping, like absolutely. Yeah. Even like the luggage, uh, like the might send back to your home country. There's all kinds of innovation you can do here. But the companies that exist today are very small. Um, they are not even apps. They're just websites. They did the work. It was very cheap. Uh, they actually used hotels to some extent. Hotels want additional revenue now that everybody's going. Um, <laughs> but there was nothing that was like there's no brand that I know of. So I think there's certainly an opportunity for someone to build this company and. And you just have to figure out how much people are willing to pay. But I, I believe people are probably willing to pay $20, $30 just to do this over a day. Uh, next question, we'll get through a couple more. Joseph from Metro Push. Metro Push is an application that sends push, push notifications from public service broadcasters to their customers. Uh, they decided to offer their product with one year free um, before an ad free subscription. And they think it's a pretty good deal. Are they hurting themselves by offering a free trial and only relying on ads for revenue? Yes. Uh, I don't think you need to offer your product for a year for free. I think you can offer it. The longest that would make sense to me would be two weeks or a month. That would be the longest type of... Um, because what you're really looking for is someone to start using your product, build some basic... Like, basically onboard themselves and try to um, figure out what the product does. And so is it, do I find it valuable? Maybe I, again, take the, the athletic example. I, I sign into the athletic. I read four articles about Toronto Maple Leafs. And I'm like, wow, this is a great, great app. Like that's all you need to know uh, about how the app works. You don't need to use that for free for another month. Um, I think at that point you want to start. You want to get someone to pay. Um, so I think that's probably a mistake to do it for a whole year. The revenue you'll make from advertising versus the revenue you make from from subscriber is going to be what are like ten to twenty x difference. So you're going to make a lot more money from subscribers, even though you have a lot fewer subscribers than you have advertisers. It's just very difficult to have an ad like a generic ad-based platform, they're using some kind of ad network today and make a lot of money. Like Because the, the CPM, the, the, the earnings are just not there. You're going to make from a very active product um, somewhere between zero and 50 cents a month at the most, probably less than that. Um, and that's with like engagement of multiple oh, minutes per day. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. So, so most likely you're talking about a couple of cents to 10 cents per user per month, which is like just not worth it. Like if, you, if that's like one $1 a year, you just can't, Nothing you can you can't you can't acquire new customers for that you can't service them there's no customer support you can't buy content it's so basically having engineering ad, ad networks today doesn't build a sustainable company and I don't think investors would want to fund you if that's what you're serious about to monetize your product. The good news is that users consumers are getting more comfortable with microtransactions paying for subscriptions like for example we had a, we have a company called uh, Substack that went through YC about a year ago they enable anyone to start a um, email newsletter that you can actually charge money for. 
I think this was somewhat of like a revolutionary concept a year ago, like who would pay for an email subscription? Um, and it turns out a lot of people are because they get this reliable content kind of on a regular basis from a high, high quality writer and they feel good because you know, the person that's writing it is like earning you know, a good wage. And it fundamentally solves a societal problem in that now the business model is aligned with the actual users of the product and yeah. they're not in conflict, which always, um, I mean, not mm. just Facebook, but even the newspapers have some of those, jo those challenges. Absolutely. Um, next up is from uh, Marinha from Growth Channel. Uh, we want to hear more about user-generated growth strategies that can be applied to B2B SaaS companies. Okay, so um, the way that you would win as a B2B company today is to make a new product that maybe solves an existing need um, and then just apply the top of like the very best consumer grade growth skills to that, that SaaS product. Because most people that are competing with aren't gonna do that. They're gonna do very traditional stuff, case studies, like old school marketing, um, Interesting. going to big events. They're not gonna do invite flows. They're not gonna do super targeted Facebook ads. They're not gonna do a lot of things that, um, they're not gonna- A great be, referral program. They're not gonna build these things into yeah. the product. So, so if I would try to grow inside a company, um, I would have connect with Google. I would um, try to figure out um, if I can get hold of, of the email I just spoke from some of the employees, I would pick out the emails from the coworkers, like based on the domain. So maybe like at whitecamera.com would be the domain that we have, and then I would figure out who is in there. Can I either recommend people that you can share or invite from based on that address book, or is there some other value that I can I can share between within? That Are you domain? saying that you should do like lookalike audiences from? No, I'm like just saying like how to grow in, in, inside a company. Oh, okay, inside a company, uh, how to grow between companies. Um, I think it's a little trickier. Uh, let's see, for example, the idea of the, of the, of the app they had. Um, the question was, should they be looking at um, a ver uh, so, so, so yeah, let's talk about virality. So, yeah. so virality, um, there's, there's certainly gonna be intercompany virality. Let's say collaboration on document. There are also virality that goes outside of that. So some documents are by nature something you collaborate with the, the broader world, world with. So if I was say Airtable, um, I will, I will look, I will try to figure out what are the most viral documents that exist today in the world. For example, the Burning Man packing list is one spreadsheet I remember being very viral. There was like 10,000 people, tens of thousands of oh, people Oh, like a Google that. spreadsheet. It was a Google spreadsheet which just went around, it was like this way packed to go to Burning Man. I would replicate that on Airtable. And I would think of all the other viral documents that are just mm. get mass distribution. And I would just see if I can do the same and what's interesting, like that's that's an enterprise like SaaS product yeah. where you pay like there's it, if you if you win the customer they're paying like twenty five bucks a month or something like that. And, and in the case of Airtable, I wouldn't just like make it viral. I would also make it embeddable. So I would take the Airtable table and be like, can you embed that on your website? And so that everyone that comes there and trying to do something specific actually see that Airtable. Um, that's how I reach like the broader market. How to reach between companies I think is a little trickier uh, because like you just got to think hard about. What do I do that relates to other employees at other companies? So let's look at Slack. Yeah. So like Slack has the ability for you to add an employee at another company into your Slack room without them having like their own Slack. It's just like you give them an account that opens into one. That's a great method if you could do something like that. That's really good. So I think like for virality, um, always think of, think about what is the sort of like what's the piece of content that I'm actually collaborating on versus sort of like oh can I just like figure out a way to invite a lot of people. Like, I, I think that's less exciting. Than so like build it into the product rather than right. just the referral strategy. So like, like in the Google Docs, you can just like add someone and they can use a common new document. You can add anybody in your email address book. That's a pretty viral thing. Um, you just have to think about like, what Google Docs can I do that for? Um, and then growing inside companies, I, I think you really want to find a way to utilize the address book of your Google, uh, SaaS, your Google Apps account. Hmm. I think that's, that's going to be the core way to do it. Um, so it's like often get their contact and then yeah, give and them then all like, accounts. Uh, well, you want to figure out like sort of like what what you should share to these other emails and like what what does an employee uh, benefit from sharing um, and that could be different things for different products. Um, the second thing is you want to make every document very easily copyable. Uh, there's a YC company we funded uh, that creates an, an um, uh, a link uh, based so like you can take any any link and then you can say air slash and then anything and then you can basically um, share their own the office. And then that company offers that, that service, but that links become sort of like physically viral because they know that air slash something um, 
um, uh, That's Golinks. Golinks. Yeah, Golinks is a company, but basically, like, there's a physical virality to, 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 to that idea inside a company, for example. Cool. Well, that's it for today. Thanks very much, Gustav. There's a lot of actionable advice that we've got in there. And uh, yeah, we'll join you. We'll be back next week for another live stream. Thank you so much. Thanks.